Hello, everybody. This is Noah and John, and we are from Urban Digs, and we got Bob Knackle here, a commercial legend, um, joining us. Thank you so much, Bob. And, you know, we got you for this short while. Um, and, you know, for anyone that's listening, um, this will be recorded and distributed. But for anyone that's here now, if you guys have questions for Bob, we got about 15, 20 minutes of, of a set question list. Um, let us know what your questions are. Put it in the chat room and we're going to end with the Q&A. OK, so think about it. This is your opportunity to get access to that brain of his. And Bob, I just want to start out right off the bat. Could you please tell us what's going on with the state of the commercial New York City real estate sector, especially when you hear all these bank loans and the worries? Is it overextended or is it warranted? Yeah, look, I got to tell you, no, it's uh, it's really a unique set of circumstances today in New York. Uh, the market is getting um, is has been and is negatively impacted by a number of things. Uh, but what I can tell you is that. Uh, you know, I think the the most interesting thing about this particular time period, and I lived through the SNL crisis in the early '90s, the um, the recession in the early 2000s, dot com bubble bursting, 9/11, et cetera, and the great financial crisis. In those other corrections, all the market segments kind of moved in unison. Um, this time, uh, different product types are performing differently. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with what's been happening in the broader market and what's been happening with policy. Uh, I think in, you know, I've been doing this 39 years now, and I've never seen the correlation between public policy and the way the real estate markets are operating than I'm seeing now. So for instance, the multifamily market, uh, we have cap rates going up because lending rates have gone up. But there's an extraordinarily healthy level of demand in that space, and rents actually are going up. So, um, you know, we it, it's really wild when there's so much downward pressure on everything. But for instance, I think free market rents in New York City are going to go up 10 to 15 percent by the end of the year because the politicians have not created or incentivized any new supply coming online. Um, so multifamily market, relatively healthy. Uh, if we look at retail, retail is a bright spot, but that's because retail rents have been dropping for five years in a row. Um, so now the general perception is that um, that rents have stopped going down, uh, leasing activity is picking up. And for the first time in many years, we're getting investors calling us saying, hey, what retail do you have? I want to buy retail. So that's a positive sign. Um, right. Then you have the land market. Uh, the land market has four different component parts in New York, hotel, office, residential rental, and residential condo. Um, the hotel land market has come to a, a grinding halt, uh, mainly because you can buy existing hotels for less than land value today in, in a lot of cases. Um, and uh, you also have to build union if you build a new hotel today on a site that's not grandfathered in. There are, are about a dozen of those. Um, but if you're not grandfathered in, you have to build union. Uh, very, very expensive. Uh, the office sector is actually the land in office is doing great, although there's not that much of it. But um, it seems like if you uh, if you build uh, a new office building anywhere in town, you're going to get triple digit rents. Uh, and that market seems to be doing well. Uh, the land market for residential rental is completely evaporated because of the lack of the 421A slash affordable New York tax abatement program. Um, and then condo land uh, is selling, but is down about 20 to 25% from where it was in September when lending rates really started to expand. So you used to be able to get a construction loan in the sixes in terms of interest rates today, that's over 10%. So uh, land is, is in interesting, decent level of demand at the newer price point. And then we have the office sector, which we could spend about two hours talking about, but I can tell you new construction class A office seems to be doing very, very well. Uh, the rest of the market is uh, is challenged, and I think we have a ways to go uh, before we work our way through and have real clarity with respect to how office is doing. So that that's probably the biggest change that I've seen is that the different product sectors are behaving uh, very differently from each other, and that's not was not the case in the last three downturns we had. 
Um, mm -hmm. And the other big change that makes today different than other downturns is that in the in the SNL crisis in the early 90s, banks went through the foreclosure process, took title to everything, hired brokers exclusively to sell them, and it was great business for us. Uh, in the recession in the early 2000s, um, banks did not want to go through that process of foreclosing, but they hired brokers exclusively to sell debt for them. Uh, that was a, a great thing. Uh, and uh, then in the, um, in the great financial crisis, again, it was a lot of loan sales that occurred. Uh, this time around, it seems like the banks are playing everything very close to the vest. Uh, rather than hiring brokers to sell debt, uh, they're going to their, their customers saying, hey, would you like to buy this debt at a discount? Uh, and uh, so that, that is another very tangibly diff tangible difference between today and past cycles. So it's it's uh, you know a lot of trying to figure out what the heck is going on and looking at market indicators every day to try to get that sense. Got it. Hi, hi, Bob. This is John here. I, I just want to follow up on some of the things you said because it's 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 really interesting. And you know, you even have a post, I think a recent one on LinkedIn, maybe just from a few hours ago, about doing a deal on 39th Street and how complicated that was and slicing and dicing and trying to make everything fit. And I guess the question I want to ask, since we have a lot of residential agents, is you know, talking about the New York City multifamily market, what are the things that a residential agent should know about? I mean, it sounds to me, some of the commercial stuff seems incredibly complicated, but I'm wondering if you're focused on just the multifamily, what sort of things should you be, uh, which should, should you be focused on? Yeah, well, you know, John, what I would say is that I think it's important for folks to stay in their lane. You know, particularly today with with so much opaqueness in the market uh, and even people who are, are focused on one area of specialization are having trouble trying to figure things out to try to do a transaction that you don't really have a good grasp on uh, is is probably not a good use of time today. In fact, if anything, I think that today you want to become a, a specialist in one particular type of property or one type of transaction or one area, one, one thing that you can really become an expert in so that when your client is, you know, facing a, a challenging time and they need to uh, figure out what to do, you can give them good advice. I think if you're really not an expert in something, it's hard to give good advice, especially today. So, you know, I would say that a, a lesson is to kind of stay in your lane uh, become a you know become more of an expert on the thing that you spend most of your time in, and try to bring tangible value to your clients. Yeah, that's that's a solid piece of advice right there. Um, Bob, I know you're a baseball fan. Um, you know that baseball card business card was just brilliant. And in case nobody knows about that, he made his business card into a baseball card with the back all of his deals, um, like like a baseball player statistics. It was just yeah, let me say I might have one here. I'll know and say let me give you one second. <laughs> <laughs> yep here we go and so Let's see it. Uh, this is the front this is a knockoff of the 1970 tops baseball card That's on the front it. and then on the back it's uh 38 years of statistics with uh yeah. company i was with the uh, the number of sales square footage and dollar volume so it kind <laughs> of started as a as a goof uh, I had a, ran into a client of mine who I'd done several deals with, but hadn't seen him in a few years. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he said he was going to be in the market shortly to get a construction loan uh, for a project he was doing out in Long Island City. And I said, hey, you should talk to our mortgage guys. They're great. And he said, oh, thanks, Bob, but I've decided I'm going to go with JLL. And I was like, hey, I've been at JLL for four years. And he's like, oh, I thought you were still at Cushion and Wakefield. So I, the idea of putting the baseball card together came up. I was going to just send it to him uh, and a couple of folks in the office saw it and say, what said, wow, this is really cool. You should, you should, you know, make more of these. And one thing led to another and it's uh, you know, I think I've done like 20,000 of them now. And I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a clever, way. it's a clever marketing um, um, tactic. And, and look, you got to think outside the box and then you got to take what you love. And, and I hate to bring it right back to the commercial sector, but I'm going to on you from a baseball analogy, Bob. Okay. Um, I want to talk about office because I'm hearing things in, 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 I think it was San Francisco. There the $300 million tower got, got the bid was 80 million or something like that, or, or these crazy numbers where, where the repricings are coming down. 
from that perspective, I look at Vornado's stock, it's still at what, $14, $15. I'm wondering if there's another layer to this um, banking situation for us close at home in New York City. Um, the office market right now, what in it do you think that it is in in its down cycle right now? Are we are we past? Are we like in the eighth and ninth inning here, or are we still neck deep in it? Uh, I think it's tough to say. I, I think that what is really going to be the the indicator that the office sector has turned around is when we start to see positive absorption and upward pressure on rents. And uh, you know, it's it's. Um, it's interesting. There's so many sources of data to look at to try to interpret that. But, you know, I've always said to folks, if you see that XYZ Corporation just took 100,000 square feet, that could be good or it could be bad. Uh, if they were coming out of 50,000 feet and took 100,000, that's great. They were coming out of 150,000 feet and took 100, that's not so great. So I think we need to see uh, what uh, is going to happen with absorption over time. Uh, a lot of tenants are not making decisions uh, until they have to. And so lease expiration is causing a lot of these decisions to be made. But I think we need more data points. One, one good thing uh, about the office market is I think that even if folks are coming in on a hybrid schedule and working two or three days a week um, or four days a week, they, they want to be sitting at their space in their office, in their cubicle. They don't, the, the hoteling concept, I don't think um, works that well, even if you're only in uh, periodically. You know, people wanna come in and see their plant or their photo of their family or whatever it is. Uh, and you don't wanna be lugging that stuff home with you every day. So, um, you know, that would necessitate more space being needed. But I think companies are trying to figure out, you know, hey, if, if you know, if we our leases renew is, is expiring, we're going to take new space. Do we have to have our graphics department in the office? Do we have to have our research department in the office? Um, you know, what functionalities can we have work from home? What uh, can't we work from home? I, I think working from home is uh, it really slows the growth curve, particularly for young folks, because I think you pick up as much just being in the office ecosystem that you do from, from formal training. You, you over, you're going to get a cup of coffee, you overhear somebody talking about a transaction, you're even in the restroom, you overhear somebody talking about a transaction and you're learning stuff. And I think that young people in the, in the business have not had that opportunity uh, to learn from just being in the ecosystem of the office. And I think that's a shame because their learning curve is relatively flat. That's interesting. So let me let me follow up on that because I think you know you mentioned you know looking at the market and trying to get some more data points about what's what's happening to get some clarity. And then you mentioned just sort of being in the office and how that affects it. Sort of there's a sort of that uh, learning by absorption. And and I'm curious, Bob, when you look at the market, what are the or sort of sort of the things that you're looking at uh, to to get a get a sense of what the latest trends are and what kind of resources do you find the most helpful? Yeah, well, number one, you know, I'm I'm a broker, so uh, the transaction volume is the number one metric that we look at. So we're identifying, you know, trying to identify how many properties are selling and what the total dollar volume is. Uh, we're also looking very carefully at uh, the supply of of listings, what's available, uh, what's the activity been like on the stuff that is available, what are, where are the bids coming in. Um, you know, I, I say looking at comparable sales is really information that could be six or seven months old. Uh, deals typically are under contract for 60 to 120 days. Uh, the bid is made 30 days before the contract is signed. Um, and so, you know, often you're, you're dealing with uh, a transaction that closes today it might be indicative of the market five, six, seven, eight months ago. Um, so what we're looking at more closely, and, and we do this anytime the market is moving um, very rapidly, uh, we look at what the activity has been on contracts that have recently been signed and contracts that we're negotiating, because that's really indicative of what the market is today. Um, so th that's the number one thing that we're looking at to try to interpret what's happening out there. Got it. Um, Bob, yeah, in this time of confusion, and, um, you know, I agree. We do a macro Monday every Monday. And I'm like, you know, I'm so confused right now with what the Fed's going to do with with if, with these rates and inflation and the slowdown. 
Um, how, how best could a professional agent in a sincere manner frame the challenges um, that exist today as opportunities for clients that maybe looking at today's markets? Yeah, well, I, it absolutely is an opportunity. For, so a couple of points. One, if you look at the price per square foot of many of the different asset classes today, properties are trading at values that they traded at 20 or 25 years ago. What sense does that make? Uh, also, talk to the experienced Notice I said experience, not older. The experienced investors that have been investing for decades, and they will unanimously tell you the best deals they ever made were deals where they, they really had to have some intestinal fortitude to pull the trigger on buying, but they bought at a relatively low price. Uh, and it was at times like this, where you have to have capital and you have to have guts. But the best deals people made are when they bought at times like we're seeing today. Um, Great. And I, now I, I'd like to open this up to some of the some of the people on here if they have questions for Bob and throw them in the chat. But before we do that, Bob, I'm just very curious. You know, if, if you had one piece of advice, I mean, because you have your volume, it starts with a B as in billion. So I'm curious if there's one piece of advice to you know getting to yes and and closing deals. What would that be? Oh gosh, that, that's another three hour conversation. But <laughs> you know, I think it's really understanding what the client is trying to achieve. That's the number one thing. Is why do they want to sell? Um, what are their objectives? And you know, just hard work is a key ingredient. Hard work, stick to itiveness. Um, you know, and and making sure that you're doing all the very fundamental things to get your transactions done. You know, this business is not rocket science. There's no magic potion or secret sauce to, to getting it done. It's just, it's just hard work, diligence, discipline to keep doing the same mundane things over and over and over again, day after day, week after week, month after month. And if what you're doing is fundamentally sound, just keep at it and things will happen and look for motivation. If you know, if you're representing sellers, which I've my whole career, I've only represented sellers. I'm always looking for motivation. And if folks don't have motivation, they shouldn't sell today. There are a number of reasons why people might sell today, even though we, we tell most folks don't sell. It's not a great time. Interest rates are up. Values are down. Hold on if you can. Um, and you know, the folks who come back at us and say, yeah, we understand that, but, and they give you a good reason why they want to sell. Those are the people you want to work for. You know, if somebody had a hundred million dollar property and they said, well, gee, if I could get 110, you know, I'll sell it. That's not the kind of, of, of seller you want to be working with in a market like today's market. Yeah. Bob, I'm so glad you said that because you know what, a lot of agents um, feel that they can't really, um, advise because it might, you know, push a transaction out and they don't want to delay a transaction. But at the end of the day, you know, this, this having an image of an advisor and actually servicing as an advisor, um, you know, you'll get the, if they're going to sell, they're going to tell you right off that. Yeah, that's great, but we need to sell. And here's why. Perfect. You know, yeah, you no, did your you thing. It's no, not I, I tell, I tell agents, the young agents, I say, pretend the client's your mom or dad. What would you, you know. tell them? And sometimes the best advice is not to sell. And most of the time, owners are really surprised when you say that to them, um, but they they will appreciate it because you're putting their best interests first. And you know what? Almost every time I've told the client not to sell now, they've come back to me a year later, five years later, 10 years later and said, you know what, Bob, I really appreciate you gave me that advice. You were right. Shouldn't have sold at that time. Now I'm ready to go. Come on, send me an agreement. Let's get it sold. Yeah. Yeah, this is a lifelong, lifelong relationship business. It, it's, um, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Don't, don't love do it. things to try to, yes, we all you know, need to make money, need to pay bills, et cetera. But don't, yeah. if you try to take shortcuts or try to make the deal today um, versus doing what's right, uh, the client's going to know it and you're going to make mistakes probably and mistakes that you shouldn't make. Think of, think of it as a, a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, great. Well, yeah. winding down here, I got a question from Joe. I just want to hit to you before we leave um, in the last few minutes here. And if you got any other questions, guys, you got a few minutes now, two minute warning, post them now in the chat. Otherwise, forever hold your peace here. Um, Joe is asking, what is the market for small and vacant development sites in Long Island City? If you happen to know any information on that. 
Yeah, well, again, I think that smaller sites actually would be more marketable today than larger sites. Uh, and that's mainly because you have to do condo to make a deal work. I mean, you could buy land anywhere in the city at $50 a buildable foot and build a 100% affordable building. And that's whether you're in the South Bronx or on Fifth Avenue, it's $50 a foot. Um, but you don't want to, most sellers don't want to sell for $50 a foot. So, um, you know, I think that in the outer boroughs, uh, smaller sites are more marketable because they, they you could build condo. It'd be very rare to see somebody want to do a 400,000 or an 800,000 foot condo building today. So a uh, smaller, I think, is better when you're you're looking for condo execution, particularly in the outer boroughs. Excellent. And I think I don't see any other questions here. So, no. John, unless you have anything, I'm going to let Bob go. And, and Bob, I'm going to thank you for your time. You're everywhere these days. Bob Knackle, Senior Managing Director and Head of New York Private Capital Group over at JLL. Is that the best way for anyone to get in touch with you? Yeah, just email me, bob.knackle at jll.com. And uh, happy to answer your questions. And if you are a residential agent and, and uh, come upon a commercial opportunity and you don't feel it's in your wheelhouse, you know, happy to pay your residential brokers a referral fee and, and help those clients out. So, um, you know, if you do have any questions or any opportunities you'd like to, to work on together, feel free to email me anytime. Yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. And Noel says, Bob drops a ton of gems on Twitter. He's a must follow. I agree. I have known Bob for about 15, 16 years since I had a full head of hair. Me and Bob were having cocktails in New York City and I love him. I, it, what you've done is incredible. And I thank you for your time. I'm honored that you came on the show today. Um, Bob Nackle, I am Noah Rosenblatt. That is John Walkup. And we will catch you guys next time. Thanks, Bob. Take care, guys. Bye.